English scripture on which the English sermon is based, and it comes from um, the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 21, and I will be reading verses 33 to 45. Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 to 45, this is the parable of the tenants, one of my favorite of Jesus' parables. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his rent, or to collect its fruit, excuse me. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scripture, The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. May the Lord bless the reading of his word this morning. And at this time, I will call upon Bob Belitarian to deliver this morning's English sermon. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the Synoptic Gospels because they are similar in their structure. Essentially, there, there are, they are historical narratives of the life, works, and teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. I counted the parables that Jesus spoke, that are mentioned in the New Testament. And I guess you're anxious because you want to know their number. And I won't keep it a secret from you, I'll disclose it. Jesus spoke 55 parables. Some of these 55 parables are mentioned only in one of the three synoptic gospels. Others are mentioned in two, in two, and very few are mentioned in all three of the Synoptic Gospels. Today's parable, which Brother Jim read for us, is mentioned in all three of the Synoptic Gospels, which makes it very important. The importance of this parable is doubled or increased when we realize that this was the last parable that Jesus spoke prior to his arrest 
and crucifixion. So of the five, of the 55 parables, this was the last one that Jesus spoke. Therefore, it is of utmost importance. This parable is an allegory, which means that each one of its chief elements has a symbolic meaning. The landlord who planted and owns the vineyard is God. The vineyard is the nation of Israel. The tenants to whom the vineyard was leased represent the religious leaders of the ancient Israelites, like the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes, who were the theologians of the day. The servants, the landlord servants, are the prophets, whom God sent from time to time to guide his people. And the landlord's son and his rightful legal heir is Jesus Christ. So you can see this parable is an allegory because each one of its main characters has a symbolic meaning. The people to whom Jesus spoke this parable recognized the vineyard imagery from Isaiah chapter 5 verses 1 through 7. If you look at Isaiah chapter 5, the opening verses, the opening seven verses, there you will see that God describes Israel as his vineyard. The similarities between the Gospel of Matthew chapter 21 verses 33 through 41 are very similar to Isaiah chapter 5 verses 1 through 7. There are similarities and there are also differences, but when Jesus spoke about the vineyard, his listeners immediately recognized that he must be referring to Isaiah chapter 5. The imagery was familiar to them. Now, God expected his vineyard to produce sweet grapes, but he was terribly disappointed when it produced sour grapes. Consequently, in Isaiah chapter 5, the owner of the vineyard destroyed it, destroyed the vineyard. In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 21, the vineyard is not destroyed, but it is transferred to other tenants. So you see there are similarities and there are also there's, there are differences. It is possible to plant a vineyard without building a watchtower and a wine press in it. But in the parable we read, in the parable that was read to us, in Matthew chapter 21, the landlord spared no expense because he built a wine press and a watchtower in the vineyard to make sure that the tenants had every advantage for a successful and efficient operation. This means that God gave the people of ancient Israel many privileges, many advantages. And I can enumerate six main privileges that the ancient Israelites had that the Gentiles didn't have. 
Number one, he rescued them from slavery. Number two, he gave them the promised land as an inheritance. Third, he gave them the law. Fourth, he established a special covenant with them, which means God established a special relationship with the people of ancient Israel. And last but not least, God protected them from many of their enemies. When the Israelites were on their way to the Promised Land, just before crossing the Jordan River, and even after crossing the Jordan River, they had to fight at least eight different peoples or uh, eight different nations. Let me enumerate some of those. First, the Jebusites. The Jebusites controlled the city of Jerusalem until the 10th century before Christ when King David conquered it and made it the capital of his kingdom. The Israelites entered the Promised Land under Joshua's leadership in the 12th century before Christ. So 200 years, for 200 years after the Israelites arrival in the Holy Land, Jerusalem didn't belong to them. It belonged to the Jebusites. King David was the one who conquered Jerusalem from the Jebusites and made it the capital of his kingdom. If you go to Jerusalem on a guided tour, some guides will point to you the remnants of the Jebusite walls that were around Jerusalem. Some of those stones still exist. When they had to fight the Amorites, the Amorites lived on the east bank of the Jordan River in what is now Jordan. The Israelites didn't want to fight the Amorites. They asked the, the Amorite king's permission for a safe passage through his country. They were on their way to the Promised Land. They had to pass through the Amorite territory and they wanted the king to grant them the assurance of a safe passage. But the Amorite king declined. And these rights had to fight. God enabled them to defeat the Amorites and destroy their city, which was Heshbon. The remnants, the ruins of Heshbon, are not too far away from the modern Jordanian town of Madaba. Then they had to fight the Moabites, who lived on the east side of the Dead Sea. They had to fight the Hittites, who lived in Hebron, in the Hebron area. Remember, Abraham lived there when he came to the Promised Land, when he left his um, Chaldean city of Ur, God led him to the Promised Land. He settled in Hebron. And when Sarah died, his wife died, he had no land in which to bury her. So he purchased a cave, the Machpelah cave, from the Hittites in order to bury his wife. So the Hittites dominated the area around Hebron. The Philistines should not be confused with the modern Palestine, Palestinians. The Philistines or Philistines mentioned in the Bible were not the Palestinians of today. Today, most of the Palestinians, the Muslim Palestinians, are the descendants of the Arab Muslim invaders who came under the leadership of Caliph Omar ibn al-Khattab and conquered Jerusalem in the 7th century. And, and so they've been there ever since. Many of the Christians, by the way, many of the Christian Arabs, Christian Palestinians, are either the remnants of the Crusaders, after Crusaders were defeated, some of them decide to live 
in the Holy Land. They didn't want to return to Europe, and Saladin allowed them to stay. But there is evidence, there is evidence that most of the Arab Christians who live in Palestine today are the descendants of the first Christians who were Jewish. So, this is interesting, but it's proven to be true by many historians that the Arab Christians who live in Jerusalem, in Bethlehem, in, in the surrounding areas are the offspring of the first Christians who were Jewish. So, many of the Arab Christians of today are uh, from Israelite origin. But that's besides the point. But then they are to fight the Edomites. The Edomites were the descendants of Esau and they lived in the southern part of what is now Israel. They lived in the Negev Desert. That area is called today the Negev Desert. And its main city today is Beersheba. Then they had to fight the Ammonites. If you read the Old Testament, you find that King David and his armies often had skirmishes and pitched battles with the Ammonites. The Ammonites lived in what is now central Jordan. All of you know the capital city of Jordan is called Amman. Where that, that name, where, where that name comes from? It comes from Ammon. Amman was the center of the Ammonites. And in the Bible, it's also mentioned that it, after one important battle, the Israelites captured the Ammonite city of Rabbah. Now, in Jordan today, there is a town called Rabbah. It's about 50 miles south, south of Amman. And it's, it's, still, it's still called Rabbah. And it was the birthplace of the late King Hussein's uh, best prime minister, who was called Majali, Al-Majali. So Al-Majali's birth, birthplace was Rabbah. So that city still exists and still carries its ancient biblical names. So you can see I met at least eight people, eight nations who were hostile to the Israelites. And the Israelites had to fight them and they prevailed because of God's help. They didn't win these battles of, of their own strength. Those, were, those victories were secured for them by God. So this shows how God took, how much God took care of them. Now let's keep our attention focused on the parable of the wicked tenants. God planted this vineyard and then he leased it out to some tenants. And these tenants were not wicked at the beginning. They were good people. Otherwise, God would not have entrusted his vineyard to them. So initially, they were good people, and God trusted them. He leased out the vineyard to them. This is similar to what is known in the United States as a sharecropper arrangement, whereby the tenants take care of the vineyard, they plant the, the vines, they harvest the grapes, and in exchange, of, in exchange for their labor, they retain a certain percentage of the produce but they're obligated to return to the owner the remainder of the fruit. It all depends on the contract, what percentage the laborers, the tenants have to keep, and what percentage is due to the landlord. So when the time of the harvest came, the owner of the vineyard sent some of his servants to gather or to receive his portion of the produce. 
if the Holy Land grapes are harvested in late July or early August. Now when the farmers see, uh, the farmers, the tenant farmers at this junction become wicked. They resort to violence. They stone some of the owner's servants. They beat others and kill some. The servants of the vineyard's owner represent the prophets whom God sent to the ancient Israelites to guide them from time to time. Now, if I were the owner of that vineyard and my servants were mistreated by the tenants who had violated the terms of the agreement, I would have hired the lawyer and kicked them out. But God didn't do that. He showed patience. He gave those wicked tenants three opportunities to repent, but they did not. Unfortunately, they did not. I said the servants of the landlord are the prophets. Did the ancient Israelites mistreat and kill the prophets of God? Yes. Historical records show that they killed at least eight of their prophets. Isaiah, one of the most prominent prophets of the Old Testament, was killed in a very cruel way. His body was cut into two sections by a very sharp saw. Jeremiah was first imprisoned and then he was stoned to death. Ezekiel was killed in Babylon by the leader of the, of the exiled Israelites whom the prophet had reprimanded for worshiping idols. The prophet Micah was killed in Samaria by Joram who was the son of the wicked king Ahab. The prophet Amos was tortured by Amaziah, who was the priest of Bethel, and later on he was killed by Amaziah's son. The prophet Zechariah was stoned to death. And John the Baptist, whom Jesus called the greatest of the prophets, was beheaded by Herod, the grandson of the infamous Herod the Great, because the Baptist had the courage to condemn him for having taken his brother's wife while the brother Philip was still alive. So, yes, there is ample proof that the religious leaders of ancient Israel mistreated, tortured, and killed at least eight of the prophets that God had sent to them. Now the landlord was dismayed and disappointed. He finally sends his son, who is the heir, his heir, his rightful legal heir. And he thinks that the wicked tenants will respect his son But that doesn't happen. When the wicked tenants see the son coming, they say, oh, he is the heir. Let us kill him and seize the inheritance. The Bible says they dragged him outside of the vineyard and killed him. Why didn't they kill, why didn't they kill the owner's son, the vineyard owner's son, inside the vineyard. Why did they drag him outside and killed him outside? It's interesting that these <clears throat> wicked tenants who represent the religious leaders of ancient Israel meticulously followed some Jewish laws 
but they are disregarded God's moral laws. Jewish law says that if a murder occurs within a vineyard, the ground of that vineyard becomes defiled and its produce, its fruit becomes contaminated. So that's why they dragged him outside the vineyard and killed him there. Now the murder of the vineyard's son outside the vineyard corresponds, corresponds exactly to Jesus' death on Golgotha, which is a hill outside the city of Jerusalem. The way the son of the vineyard's owner was killed outside the vineyard, Jesus was killed outside the holy city. Now, <clears throat> Jesus, the father, sorry, Jesus, the son of the father is the rightful heir of everything the father possesses and he acted in with the authority of the father so by murdering the son the ancient jewish religious leaders rejected god because the son represented his father and he acted with the authority and the consent of the father so when the religious leaders of ancient Israel rejected the son and murdered him. They also rejected God and God's authority. In the epistle to the Hebrews, the same thought is expressed. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, the writer says, In times past, God spoke to our fathers through the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us through his son, whom he has appointed heir over all things. God had appointed Jesus heir over everything. So when these wicked tenants see the son coming, they decide to kill him thinking by eliminating the air they would seize the vineyard that this is the vineyard would become theirs and that wasn't true <laughs> to take possession of the vineyard they had to kill not only the owner's son but they had to kill the owner himself see this shows that when people allow sin to dominate their lives their minds stop working properly, they lose their insanity, their cognitive powers become impaired. Those people couldn't think straight. By murdering Jesus, the vineyard did not become their property. God was still the rightful owner of the vineyard. Now, Matthew chapter 21 verse 40 Jesus asks the Jewish religious leaders who were his audience what will the owner of the vineyard do to those wicked tenants he poses this question to them and they answer it they say he should destroy those wicked tenants and lease out the vineyard to others. Without realizing it, the Jewish religious leaders pronounced judgment on themselves. Without realizing it, they indicted themselves. Because the last verse in, in Matthew chapter 21 says, the religious leaders, the chief priests, the elders, the scribes knew that Jesus was speaking about them. They knew that this parable was addressed to them. Right. 
this parable may lead some Christians to develop spiritual pride. They may be tempted to think, oh, God took away this vineyard from those unbelieving, disloyal Jews and gave it to us because we're worthy. We're better than the ancient Jews. Such a conclusion, such a deduction is completely false. This parable should serve to us as a warning that the same judgment that God pronounced on the first tenants of the vineyard, he will pronounce on the second tenants, the Gentiles, if they remain unproductive, unfruitful, and be disloyal to him. The Apostle Paul expresses the same thought in Romans chapter 11, verses 7 through 21, 17 through 21, through the metaphor of the olive tree. The Apostle Paul uses the metaphor of the olive tree, and the olive tree represents ancient Israel. But some of the branches of this olive tree became unfruitful, and they had to be cut off and discarded. And in their place, new branches were grafted into the olive tree. Those branches that were cut off because of unbelief represent the, the Jewish religious leaders. And the new branches that were grafted in their place represent the Gentile believers, the Gentile Christians. And then the Apostle Paul issues this warning. If God did not spare the original branches because of their unbelief, neither would he spare us if we be disloyal and unfaithful to him. You see, both Jesus and the Apostle Paul tell us not to boast because of our elevated status. Yes, we have a privileged status because of our connection to Jesus Christ. But that should not lead us to feelings of superiority that should not make us boast. We have to be cognizant of the fact that stewardship, with stewardship come responsibilities. God entrusted his vineyard to us. We are his stewards. As such, we are highly privileged, but we also have responsibilities. We have to bear fruit for the kingdom of God. We have to remain loyal to the owner of the vineyard. As we approach the end of the Lenten season, May we evaluate our commitment to Jesus Christ and ask God to strengthen and to renew our faith. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, may nothing separate us from you today. Teach us how to choose only your way so that each step we take will lead us to, to a closer union with you. Help us to be guided by your word and not by our feelings or by the thoughts and opinions of other people. Help us, Father, to keep our heart pure and undivided. Protect us from our careless thoughts, words, and actions. We pray, Father, that you will extend your healing hand and touch the sick and restore them to health. Today, in a special way, we pray for our brother in the faith, Zabin Khanjan, the CEO of the AMA, who a week ago underwent 
a quadruple bypass surgery. We're glad that you spared his life and we pray that you will be with him during the recovery period. Let him feel your presence and may his faith never waver, remain unshakable throughout this time. May we never get distracted by our wants or our desires and our thoughts on how things should be. Help us, Father, to embrace what comes our way as an opportunity rather than a personal inconvenience. And finally, help us to rest in the truth of the eternal gospel, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.